This is joint work. Um, it's an interdisciplinary piece of work with Nick Jones um, at Imperial Biomaths, Chris Knight at Manchester Life Sciences, and Pantelis, Hajj Pantelis, Warwick Statistics. Okay, the work is about evolved functional data. So we're thinking about a collection of living creatures and measuring a trait for each of these creatures. Now, um, the trait might be numerical. So for example, the average mass of the brain in, in an adult of the species. Or the trait could be a function. So for example, the average growth curve of the species. So that would be a function with the horizontal axis being time and the vertical axis being mass. So for each species, we have a measured function. So uh, in, in the bottom left there, we might have one function for man, one for the lion, a different function for the ox, and so on. Now, why have I chosen man, lion, and ox? Well, it's because of this nice quote uh, from Aristotle way back when. And Aristotle simply pointed out that when we're considering these measured traits of species, those species, if they have some period of shared evolution, that's going to create dependence between the traits that we measure so we don't treat them as an independent sample. <clears throat> so how is that dependence normally encoded? Well, through a uh, phylogeny or family tree. So each of these creatures will represent a tip uh, of this phylogeny. And in fact, the situation's um, a little more complex even than Aristotle pointed out. Um, you'll see that the branch lengths of this tree are not all equal. This is not an ultrametric tree. If we uh, measure the length from the root of the tree to any tip, th those lengths vary across the tree. So um, <clears throat> each of these traits will not only be not independent uh, of others, but also they're not identically distributed. The longer, um, the longer the evolutionary process has run, the greater the variance in the observed trait. So our work is building on, um, on a body of work that corrects for phylogeny in the case of numerical traits like, like brain mass. So they're called phylogenetic comparative methods, and they use these phylogenetic trees to compare species. And they rely on having an explicit mathematical model of the evolution of these traits. And using, using these methods, we can do various things, so we can estimate how quickly a trait has been changing along uh, evolutionary history, so we can estimate rates of evolution in traits. We can try to estimate um, for ancestral species who are not around anymore, who we can't measure, we can try to estimate what the values of the traits were for those ancestors. Uh, we could take we could measure two different traits per species and test whether the, ver the observed variation is correlated or not. So for example, brain mass and body mass, do bigger creatures have bigger brains? Clearly I hope the answer is no, um, but that's something that you could test. Um, we could take a step back and even think, does the phylogeny explain the observed variation at all? Or is the observed variation really unrelated to evolution? So we could taste, te test for phylogenetic signal. OK, so what about these explicit models of trait evolution? Well, they essentially, there are various models, but they essentially make two standard assumptions. So first of all, conditional independence. So if we take two species, and if we know the uh, trait values for all of their common ancestors, then conditional on that information, then those two traits are statistically independent. 
And secondly, um, if we think about any single branch in the tree, so moving from the root to any tip, then statistically speaking, that evolutionary process is the same no matter which branch we go down. So the statistical relationship between a trait and any of its descendants is independent of the tree topology. Okay, so just, um, just a quick example in the numerical case. So for example, body mass. Um, so the idea here is that we have a very simple phylogeny with just three tips and we have three, so those correspond to three species, A, B, and C, and the, the body mass um, of A, B, and C are nine, seven, and two grams, respectively. A and B have a common ancestor X, a most recent common ancestor X, and the maximum likelihood estimate of the body mass of X would be eight. We can't observe X, it's not around anymore. And then X and C have a most recent common ancestor, D. So how do, we, how do we run this method in this example? Well, what we do is, is to observe that because of the two assumptions before, then the evolution along the red arc, the evolution along the red arc is independent of the evolution that's taken place along the blue arc. So we divide the uh, observed evolution into independent parts, standardize those. Uh, we have then something called standardized contrasts. Under the model, each of those contrasts has a Gaussian distribution, so we can then proceed to do um, normal statistical tests uh, under the null hypothesis that the, that the model holds. So just, just as an example, the contrast between A and B is nine minus seven, so that contrast has a value of two. The variance of that contrast is proportional to the length of the red arc. So the variance is four, standard deviation is two on the, along the bottom line. Um, similarly, the contrast between X and C is estimated to be eight minus two, which is six. The length of that arc is nine, standard deviation three. And so, dividing the values by the standard deviations, we arrive at our standardized contrasts. We've done that for body mass. We could, for example, do that also for brain mass and then test, um, test whether those two are correlated or not. Um, so that was the numerical case. But as I said, traits can be functional. So this slide is just... Uh, a collection of different examples of functions that functional traits that could be measured. So on the top left, you've got uh, what, what are called reaction norms for two different genotypes. Those are functional. On the bottom left, we've got a mass charge distribution for a proteome of yeast. Um, on the right, we have some <coughs> growth curves. These are, in fact, the growth curves of some non-avian dinosaurs, wonderfully. So we've got some functions, and these functions are evolving over time. So on the, on the left-hand side of this slide, vertically we have time. Um, as you can see, we've got these functions which are evolving over time, and, and they describe a surface. If, uh, if our model is to generalize the numerical models, then that surface is a Gaussian process. Now, um, there is a body of work already which uses Gaussian processes in uh, statistical inference. Um, for example, there's a, there's a body of work known as Krieging, which is used in geostatistics. Um, and the idea there is to make inference about the concentrations of mineral ores that are under the ground and not directly uh, observable everywhere. So there's a connection there to, for example, Krieging. Um, the difference is that in Krieging you don't have this conditional independence assumption, so assumption one wouldn't play a role, um, for example, in a, in a Krieging study. So um, we, tested, we tested this model to see, uh, see how it's performing. So we took a phylogeny which we generated randomly, uh, shown there, and we, in the computer, evolved some functions randomly along this phylogeny respecting the two assumptions 
um, that, I, that I showed before. We then only allowed ourselves to look at the phylogeny, so we knew what the phylogeny was, and we only allowed ourselves to look at the functions at the tips of the phylogeny. And we set ourselves the challenge of estimating what were, what was the function at the root. So the correct answer would have been uh, that function there. <coughs> the first um, stumbling block that we came up against was the gradual realization that functional PCA wasn't the right thing to do. Um, or at least functional PCA alone wasn't the right thing to do um, when we started to analyze these observed functions at the tips. Why is that? Well, how did we, how did we, how did we artificially create these functions? We took three bumps, so the bumps are in the top left of that slide, and we created random functions by artificially evolving some coefficients which were used to mix those three bumps in different proportions as we move through the tree, respecting the two uh, assumptions. Now, running PCA on the observed data gave what you see in the bottom left, so, um, so not a great approximation to the original signals. And then we, we realized, of course, that's not going to work, is it? Because um, these basis functions we've chosen are not orthogonal. PCA returns orthogonal signals, so it's not the right thing to do. The fact that the data are not identically distributed at, the, at this point came to our aid. So although the coefficients were marginally Gaussian, they were jointly non-Gaussian, they were jointly from a mixture Gaussian distribution because they had different variances. And that, um, that non-Gaussian property jointly of these mixing coefficients was enough to make ICA work. So in the end, we, we combined PCA with ICA, independent components analysis, and that gave the results that you see in the bottom, uh, the bottom right, um, which, which are clearly a better approximation to the original basis signals. That was, that's the first step in a, uh, a pipeline which we developed. Um, so this pipeline tells you what to do if you're given these functions at tips and you want to make inference. You want to, for example, estimate this ancestral function. Um, there isn't time uh, in, in this short talk to, to describe that pipeline fully, but it's, it's a Bayesian approach um, based on uh, Gaussian process regression. And you can find the details um, in the reference there on the right. <clears throat> so how did we do? Um, these are the results. So um, what, what are we seeing? From, um, from right to left, if you look at the black line, so the black line was the function that was generated artificially uh, in each of the three panels. The dark gray profile, so that's the amount of variation that, the, uh, that we fitted, that the model fitted uh, in, our, in our Bayesian inference. Um, so that's, that's a little bit like a, a functional standard deviation um, that, that we fitted. The red lines are the estimates that we fitted for the functions. And there's also, uh, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a light gray uh, profile. So we made, the, we made the challenge a little bit harder for ourselves by mixing in this phylogenetic variation with some essentially white noise. So we added some completely independent functional variation to each of the tips. So the model was also, and as you can see, we added quite a lot actually to, to make this thing hard. Um, so the, the, the light gray profile is estimating the amount of variation that's unrelated to phylogeny. Um, there's no light gray profile um, for the other panels because clearly non-phylogenetic variation is not something that we can model with a phylogenetic method. So that's why when we're estimating ancestors, we're just trying to estimate the phylogenetically related part of the variation. So, so the, there they are, the, the black line is the right answer, the red line is our estimate, and the, uh, the dark gray profile is the estimate 
something like functional standard deviation. Um, and, and I guess we were reasonably pleased um, with those results. So, um, yeah, just to, just to conclude, what we've done is to define a class of models um, which we call phylogenetic Gaussian process models, which can be used for the comparative analysis of function valued traits. We developed a method for practical statistical inference based on, uh, based on those models, uh, given a set of evolved functions. We verified the method on some synthetic um, evolved functional data. And the next step, uh, in collaboration with Chris Knight at Manchester in, in Life Sciences, is to, um, we're going to take some of those mass charge distributions that I showed for proteomes for, um, for 13 different kinds of yeast. And um, we know the phylogeny. We have the observed um, mass charge distributions at the tips. We're going to run the method um, on that data and, and see what we can turn up. I'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we've got time for a, a couple of questions, if there are any questions. Uh, hi, John. Uh, so you just mentioned that so at the beginning you used the Gaussian process uh, regression model, and uh, later you said that you used ICA and uh, uh, PCA. So what actually, yeah, you use them all together, or you, you, you just use them separately? Was it yeah. different to programs? Yeah. So what you, what you saw on that slide um, was that PCA returned something like the correct uh, original basis signals, but they were mixed with each other. So the, the, spa the functional space spanned by the PCA output was the correct space. It's just that the basis functions weren't resolved in, uh, they, weren't, they were mixed together. So we, we ended up running PCA first for dimension reduction to get the, the correct functional subspace. And then ICA was used to resolve um, the individual non-orthogonal basis functions that we, that we mixed together. Yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, we should thank our speaker once again and, and move on in our programme. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, so our next presentation is on functional factor analysis for periodic remote sensing data, and our speaker is Surajit Ray. Uh, so uh, I will speak on the uh, re a related topic to what John just spoke on. So it is also uh, kind of pointing out that functional principle component works pretty well in describing the variation, but uh, the interpretation uh, might not be quite right. I mean, it, it happens in multivariate data too, that you do f uh, PCA, it describes the process very well, but the components are not uh, easily interpretable. So we use functional, uh, uh, we use factor analysis in multivariate situations. So I'm just trying to expand it to factor analysis uh, for functional data and uh, we will see that it has very obvious choices that we can make a nice interpretation and even nice numerics and computation. So the background of this research was actually a, a NSF National Science Foundation in US grant on, uh, it was uh, a joint geosciences and maths grant. So it will, the proposal was to understand global change analysis, that is how uh, dynamically the ecosystem uh, responds to climate change or uh, temperature change. So this is the overall picture, but we just looked at a few very uh, interesting questions in involving just uh, one variable uh, currently. So the types of data can be, you know, the overall rainfall, time series, the land surface temperature, the sea surface temperature, and ecosystem data can be vegetation indices, how green the trees are at a particular time of the year. Uh, and it can, it, 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 there are events which are not exactly functional or not smooth, like fire, logging, but we, we are not dealing with that, but it might come into play uh, in the overall picture. So the main reason why we uh, move towards functional data is that uh, 
many of these observations are very smooth processes. And, but in the literature, in the geosciences literature, mostly uh, they are uh, either treated as time series or just plain multivariate. But there is a very naturally a, time, a, a functional data component there. They have very distinct a seasonal and annual component. And the feedback mechanism is often complex. That is how a climate change fits into the change in ecosystem, how that again fits into the uh, climate change. So these are all very uh, complex related. And uh, instead of looking at it on a particular time point, we believe that if you look at the functional changes, it would be a more wholesome approach. So we will uh, today, in this talk, we will mainly deal with just a single variable question as to whether uh, uh, the greenness of trees at different times of the year changes due to uh, some uh, annually from year to year to the change. And it might be that we don't want to have explore the overall uh, variation of uh, overall signature of greenness, but when the season starts, how long the season goes on, when does the browning starts, and uh, you know whether the main thing is that whether it changes from year to year. So, and there are multiple variable questions which I will not deal with in this talk. So, this is a typical uh, observation of uh, the uh, ecosystem that we are looking at, it's just the greenness of trees. This is called a vegetation index. It's actually a satellite-based observations, but uh, it, these indices are calculated based on multiple channels. So there are a lot of, uh, and, and often we see uh, missing observations due to cloud or uh, other um, uh, interference. But this is a typical uh, so-called uh, yearly index of this tree. So we just treat it as a single function uh, instead of this multivariate observations. And each of these, you will see 46 observations here because these are eight day periods. That's when uh, the satellite takes a, a new measurement each, each eight day. So uh, I mean, these are, uh, this slide is just showing the typical uh, way we handle uh, functional data. This is nothing particular to this talk. This is the standard uh, approach that yji are the discrete observations but we believe that it comes from this function fj j is for j is the jth curves index and i is the ith time point and uh, obviously the observation comes with some additive error to the actual function and we uh, get to the function by uh, minimizing this uh, least square size approach, but with a penalty on the smoothing. Otherwise, it will try to fit all uh, the da all data points exactly, and that will not be a smooth curve. And you can vary this smoothness by either varying uh, the lambda, uh, that is the penalty, uh, or uh, the type of penalty that you put. We, you, here we are just doing a second derivative smoothness penalty. You can put a fourth derivative. You can have a combination of second and fourth derivative, depending on the situation uh, where which one you want to have. And then the typical way that the function is described is through a, a basis function. It can be a Fourier basis. It can be a B-spline basis or any other basis of your choice. And when most of the time when you are taking a saturated basis, you don't have to worry about what basis you choose. So the data comes from this um, a place called Harvard Forest. This, has, this is near Harvard University, but has nothing to do with Harvard University. It's, it's a place in central Massachusetts called Harvard uh, Forest Area. The reason we chose this area is that they have some ground observations too in this area. But Currently, we just use the satellite observations, 25 into 25 pixels, so 625 observations. These are spatially correlated, but we have not taken that into account. So this is an overall six-year uh, vegetation index. The uh, upper uh, left one shows the six-year vegetation index. And you can see that they are going together because these are all deciduous uh, trees. So there's not much, um, you know, in so the seasonal variation is very much expected. So what we are trying to say is that, okay, there is va this variation and it is dominated by seasonal variation. We will definitely take the seasonal variation out. What we are looking for is that 
over these six years, has, is there any trend that we can find out? So we, what we intend to do is that uh, there is this periodicity, we want to take that out, but is there any other extra annual variation that just thing change from year to year and can we describe that appropriately? And, so, and then the follow-up question is, is this change like a trend or it is going up and down? And then we can kind of correlate it to uh, whether temperature has changed over those years and then we can make a possible hypothesis as to this trend has, uh, is due to the temperature change. But we are just, uh, for this analysis, we are just trying to describe the variation uh, along these six years. So uh, I, I'll describe this functional principle component in very quickly because this is uh, very close to how we describe uh, the describe standard multivariate uh, principle component analysis. I'll maybe go to the uh, picture, and this is, again, you can see what, what John showed, that uh, these are the first four principle components. You can see this dominating, uh, we, we have taken the seasonal component, but there is still seasonal uh, variances, and you can see that in the, uh, the first PC, it's the upper uh, panel, red curve, and you can see this red ones uh, having this seasonal, but it is mixed with other ones. So, because the species are just describing the data, it doesn't even know that these six years will have something in common. common. It is just extracting the variation. So how do we describe this uh, so that we can interpret it more clearly? Uh, these are uh, the standard scree plot as to how many you choose. We have chosen 46 because it describes a decent percentage of the variation. We could have chosen, if we just want to describe 95%, there will be a huge number, so we just chose 46. But let's see what uh, we are trying to do here. So this is the multivariate factor analysis, if you recall from that we, we will have these loading functions, uh, L, and these factors. And there are some assumptions about these factors, that the, the factors have to be independent. They should be uh, independent and unit variance. And these errors also have to be independent. And they should have a diagonal variance. So in the functional factor analysis also, we do uh, very similar things, except that there is a slight variation. And this is mainly for numerical, um, uh, numerical advantage, but the Interpretation doesn't change. Instead of having unit variance of the factors, we just have a diagonal variance of the factors. Because these factors, we can make them unitless in standard multivariate analysis. On the other hand, we make these error variances. Uh, we don't allow them to be vary over the different components. We just make it a standard sigma squared DST. DST is just the uh, identity matrix. So again, these are all the math behind it, but we, we will just try to, uh, so these are, if I retain the 46 components, the 46 principal components, and I do a factor analysis on them, these are the different factors. And this is the Varimax rotation. This is the standard uh, which is prescribed in uh, the book by Ramsey, and that's uh, the first choice we do in even multivariate. And it is doing exactly the thing that it is supposed to do. It is attributing the variances to one single uh, in a time point, most of the variation to one single time point and adjusting the other ones. But we have a year-to-year -year repetition that is not captured here. Now there is obviously, there is this, um, uh, we, we know that if we use, retain a lot of components, Varimax is not the best choice to do. So but let's say that we retain only four components. It doesn't explain a lot of the variation but let's say we retain only four components, still it doesn't do the job. Uh, I mean, it is again doing it what it is supposed to do, that it is spreading it out on particular time point. It is getting some of the seasonal components because the principal components themselves are seasonal, but it is still not giving you the right interpretation. So what we propose is that we will describe a principal periodic component uh, type of factor analysis. We have, will have a desired structure that it is annual and periodic, and we will have a residual structure which is extra annual, and they should be ideally orthogonal. 
So the desired structure uh, is represented uh, in terms of the basis function. Now, you don't have to have periodic. You, you, if your problem suggests that you, you should uh, have step function, you can have this uh, desired basis function as the step function, basis, uh, desired structure as the step function, and describe it in appropriate basis functions. So mainly, what we are trying to do is that we have a desired space and we have this principal component space, we will rotate the principal component to match this desired space. So in application assuming trailing FPCs, uh, we, we are estimating the errors and choose the uh, FPCs and we will rotate them. So how do we do that in mathematical notations? This is what we do. So let's say the Fs are the desired, uh, the annual period, so these F describes the basis F describes exactly annual basis. So, and these FPCs might be described by other basis functions, which are saturated basis to describe the data. And then you get the PCs based on these uh, original data and retain, let's say, 46 PCs. And then you rotate them to match your uh, desired structure. Now, this might be seem seemingly a daunting task because you are trying to rotate functions to match another set of functions uh, with uh, some uh, uh, adjusting the coordinates. But we can translate everything in uh, basis function notations, and it becomes a matrix problem instead of a function problem. So basically, again, there are a lot of notations here. This is already a published work, so I will uh, not spend too much time on the mathematics, but I'll mainly try to do it in terms of interpretation, that it finally turns out to be that you want to find uh, the maximum correlation between the desired, desired structure and your principal component structure, and that turns out to be just a simple uh, maximization of this, and in terms of it is, it is not computationally very expensive because it, it's just a simple uh, canonical correlation calculation. So you think about the stru desired structure at, as x and your principal component structure as y, and you are just calculating the uh, canonical correlation between x and y. So the main thing is that you are rotating both. You are not fixing one and rotating the other. You are rotating your desired structure and you are rotating your principal component structure and getting uh, to the, uh, the, the best possible explanation. So let's look at the uh, output from here and uh, I, I will uh, describe, it, uh, describe one of them at least. So this is the first uh, pair. So let me see which one the red, yeah the red one is the PPC and the blue one is the benchmark. So what is the difference between them? The benchmark is the rotation of the annual Fourier. So the benchmark will be exactly periodic, okay? But we know that our data has some variation in it. So we are not, we are trying to get as close to periodic as possible. So by rotating the principal component, we cannot go directly to, we cannot go as, we cannot achieve exact benchmark, but we can achieve very close to benchmark. So in the, the first, first canonical correlation or this first rotation uh, gets you 0.996 correlation. So that suggests the first principal component is quite close to periodic. And then you can see the second one is slightly less close. And let's see the third one is, so there are two things here. One is that, okay, Let's go to the last one uh, in, in the picture. That's the 15th component. First of all, the correlation between the PPC and the desired structure, that's the annual, is quite less. But even beyond that, even if it was very close to the desired structure, you can see though this is uh, annual, but this is very jagged. It's like jumping uh, half a month up and down. So it still doesn't have this seasonal component. It's, it's annual, that it, it, the blue one is repeating the same structure each year, but that's not what we uh, want in the uh, actual interpretation. So we would like to stop somewhere and not go until the end for the, inter for the interpretation purpose. So let's see, so this is a 
really nice graphics that gives you a good interpretation of all the steps that's involved. So the red one are the, are the PCs. So that's doing exactly what it is supposed to do, again, explaining the maximum variation that you can get for uh, a particular number of components that you choose. The black one is the Varimax rotation. So the Varimax spreads it out more or less evenly over all the components. So each component is explaining more or less equal number, equal amount of variation. The benchmark is the one that is exactly periodic. So it cannot explain all the variations. In fact, it's, it's explaining just 50% of the variation. So this is what would have happened if we said that, okay, things are periodic, we will only take a periodic basis and explain the factor. So you will uh, only be able to explain 50% of the variation. But these PPCs are a nice combination between the two. So it is starting off as strictly periodic and then moving towards the aperiodic part. So you, we have to make a hypothesis-based decision as to where we will cut it off so that we can say, okay, this portion of the variation is periodic, this is extra periodic, and then you uh, go on to in interpret the extra periodic if that's of interest. So this is another graphics that the red one shows the first principal component of the whole data. It is, you can see that it is mainly periodic because the whole data is dominated by periodic variance. But once you have taken all the annual component, all the interesting annual components out and then do a FPC on the remaining extra annual component, you can clearly see that the blue one doesn't contain that much of the annual variation. In fact, it is showing a trend from up to down. What the interpretation of this trend is, it's, it's a slightly bit complicated and I'll not go into that. Uh, but th this is how you separate it out. So it has a clear interpretation as to this is annual, this is extra annual. And again, you don't have to uh, restrict yourself to these, only this annual desired structure. If you're, it's, it's a step function or you have any desir desired function that you want to interpret it as, you can say that all my functions should be one hump and that's it. I, I don't want the two hump function and that's, uh, we can do that too. Now, Again, just to summarize, the advantages of uh, PPC is, let's say, I mean, there are two sets of advantages. One is over the multivariate analysis. It mimics the natural phenomenon. Uh, it's, uh, so in multi most of the time, as I said before, that in, in this time series type of approach of remote sensing data, you will have a lot of missing data. And even if the multivariate uh, method works, uh, you have to somehow interpret, uh, interpolate this missing data, but for a functional data, you just have less observations to estimate the function, so that's very useful, and can answer many relevant scientific questions in their natural scale as to, in multivariate data, if you want to judge what is the rate of change or what is the, uh, when is the browning period, you have to take a numerical derivative of the multivariate function of the time series, but here, you can just interpret the, uh, instead of taking the original function, you can take the first derivative function and do the analysis. And easy to combine data for heterogeneous temporal scale. What I, why, why I point this out? Because this satellite, they are not, um, you know, uh, they, they change over time. You could, might get a better instrument which takes data every two days instead of eight days. It might take data at higher resolution. So if it was multivariate data, you have to completely change your metric structure. But here, you just have more observations to estimate the same function. And over functional uh, rotations, uh, it's much better than the Varimax rotation. It is robust to the choice of pieces retained that even if you saw that the Varimax interpretations change completely based on whether you retained only four or you retained all 46. And uh, you can get a clear separation of annual and extra in annual in this uh, structure. So just to point out to the resources, this is the paper that we published in uh, with my student and my collaborators, and these are the awards that uh, supported this research. Thank you.
so we have we have time for uh, one very quick question. If anyone has, oh, okay. So how, how do you solve the identification problem? For which? identification problem for the factor analysis model. The factor yeah. analysis model here, we just have the you know you get the pieces, you choose uh, how many you want to return, and then it's just a uh, you rotate it to the desired structure, which is given by another, let's say, annual Fourier basis. So I'm not sure wh where it might appear. Yeah, since in, in, in functional factor analysis, I think that uh, the loading matrix is not unique. So how, how do you solve this problem? So yeah, here, you, you here we just solve it uh, by the given conditions that you know the errors has to be uncorrelated and uh, the uh, you you just um, uh, so this you, you mean the a, a, a rotated L is the same as the L. So uh, it, it so th we fix it by saying that this rotated L has to be uh, the uh, it has to maximize this correlation between the uh, FPC and this uh, and and the desired factor. I think we uh, probably have to, to move on, so thank you once again. Thanks. We'll talk about uh, another research within the same research program. And uh, in fact, this is a research uh, program uh, funded with the Southern Grant by the Italian Ministry of University and Research uh, and aims at developing an innovative method for the analysis of functional data by interfacing advanced statistical techniques and advanced numerical analysis techniques. Um, now, the uh, problem I will focus on in, during this talk is the problem of estimation of surfaces or spatial fields, in fact, if you prefer, when you have some problem-specific a priori knowledge about the uh, surface that you want to estimate, about the phenomenon and the study. Now, this uh, problem-specific um, information comes, may come from the physics, the mechanics, the morphology, uh, the chemistry of the problem, and it is formalized in terms of a partial differential equation, a governing PDE. Now, uh, PDEs are commonly used uh, uh, in many fields of sciences and engineering to uh, describe a complex phenomenal behavior, and here the idea is to profitably include this convenient mathematical modeling description into the definition of advanced uh, statistical models. Now, thanks to this, we will be able to model space variation in a way that is directly suggested by our a priori knowledge on the phenomenon, and that it is extremely flexible, um, accounting naturally, for instance, for anisotropies or um, non-stationarities. Uh, this requires, of course, a strong synergies of various approaches from uh, different uh, scientific disciplines, including, of course, uh, staff, math, uh, and engineering. Now, we shall assume a typical functional data analysis approach and a functional data analysis model, likewise in the previous talk, with the only difference that here F will be a surface, not a curve. And uh, so uh, ZI will be noisy and discrete observation of the surface F at the location PI scattered over some uh, bounded region of the plane. Just to illustrate uh, with some data we have been working with, uh, these are buoy data in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic shore, and these measure quantities uh, such as water surface temperature or salinity, and uh, you want maybe to estimate the, uh, um, the uh, water surface uh, temperature, the map, the function, the spatial field of water surface temperature. Uh, now, the inclusion of simple form of PDE uh, in statistical model have been already explored in the literature, of course. The classical example is template spline. They uh, estimate the function f by, mi by minimizing this penalized sum of square error criteria where you have the sum of square errors and a penalty that involves a very simple form of uh, uh, partial differential equation. A uh, more recent proposal is, for instance, by various splines, uh, by Gilas and Lai. They um, include, uh, they minimize uh, a very uh, similar um, um, penalized sum of square error, but the penalty may involve uh, some higher order uh, derivatives. Uh, along the same uh, line uh, are the Feldsplines, Sophie's Mountain, and Spatial Spline Regression Models. 
Uh, these have the advantage that they uh, include uh, specifically the uh, shape of the uh, domain of interest into the uh, estimator, which means that you can consider very complex uh, uh, domains uh, with complex boundaries, uh, even strong concavities or poles. Uh, and this is, of course, important in many applications. For instance, consider the water temperature or salinity. It's obvious that uh, values on either side of the Florida Peninsula cannot influence each other directly. So you need to consider the shape of the domain. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you're curious about it, I uh, will talk about it in a section this afternoon uh, of the invited paper from JRSS. Um, although not in, the exactly, uh, in this exact framework, but these are all also linked to the model introduced by Lindgren, Rue, and Lindstrom, which instead are based on a stochastic partial differential equation. Now, all the differential equations considered in this model, they are extremely simple form of PDEs. In fact, normally they give some measure of the local curvature of the function on the domain. That is, we are regularizing the estimate, simply saying that we do not want too high local curvature, we do not want our estimate to be too wiggly. Now, what we want to do here is taking the rationale of the bond uh, between PDEs and statistical model much uh, beyond this current use. And in particular, we will uh, um, include in the penalty more complex form of PDEs uh, that describe our a priori uh, information about uh, the uh, phenomenon under study. And this is used to model the space variation. And in fact, it gets included uh, this. Uh, differential model that describes the uh, phenomenon behavior gets included into the penalty term and used to regularize the estimate. Now, effectively, if you want to interpret this uh, on a Bayesian framework, this is uh, the prior. Of course, the sum of square error is a log likelihood, is a Gaussian log likelihood, but you can consider other form of log likelihood. And the smoothing parameter lambda, um, that gives the concentration, the strength of the prior, in fact, is balancing the data fidelity criterion, the sum of square error, and the model fidelity criterion. Now, what we are doing when we specify our a priori information on the phenomenon by means of this PDE and we include it in the model, we are effectively uh, describing the covariance structure of the spatial field. And this offers an important uh, alternative and completely, completely new alternative to the classical paradigm followed uh, in uh, function in spatial data analysis, where instead you have to directly choose the um, shape of the covariance structure, usually maternal, or Gaussian, or spherical. Now, in the proposed approach, we have a, a large flexibility, modeling flexibility, because by the diffusion tensor field, we can induce non stationary and anisotropic diffusion. With the transport vector field, we can include a, a directional smoothing, which, to the best of my knowledge, you cannot do with the classical uh, covariance structure. And with the reaction term, we can have a non-stationary shrinking effect. Now, if you think of the application about the Gulf of Mexico, um, then you, we, for instance, can include information about the Gulf Stream and uh, use this information uh, in order to improve our uh, statistical <coughs> estimate. Now, in fact, the application that has driven uh, this uh, research comes instead from the medical field uh, and originates from an applied uh, uh, Mm, program in cardiovascular research, uh, which is the Mathematics for Carotid Enterectomy project. This has involved uh, various uh, um, researchers from different scientific fields, uh, statisticians, computer scientists, uh, numerical analysts, and of course medical doctors, in particular the vascular surgeon of the major hospital in Milano, with the aim of studying the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, which is one of the um, leading causes of death in developed countries. Now, uh, in particular, we want to explore how the fluid dynamics of the blood and the morphology of the vessel uh, influence the uh, formation and the progression of atherosclerotic plaques. We have two types of data. We have echocolor Doppler measurement of the blood flow velocity field within the common carotid, and we have a magnetic uh, resonance imaging of this uh, vessel from where we get the uh, reconstruction of the morphology of the vessel. Um, this is the data, the echo color Doppler uh, scanner. You can see the, uh, this is the common carotid, and the echo color Doppler measures the velocity of the blood particle in the direction longitudinal to the vessel, and it does it within elliptic beams, 
and over time. So on the bottom, you can see the signal acquired during the uh, time lapse of about three heartbeats. And uh, um, our time, of course, of crucial clinical interest is a systolic peak, uh, which we will focus on now. Uh, now, this uh, acquisition are taken at the cross uh, section of the carotid, two centimeters before the bifurcation in external and internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is one of the major arteries bringing blood to the brain, and is where this bifurcation is the preferential place where this uh, plaque grows. We have uh, the reconstruction of the uh, arterial wall of the section uh, from uh, uh, MRI, and we have this seven echocolor Doppler acquisition, these are seven beams. So this, the color here display uh, the mean velocity of the blood particle within the beam at systolic peak. From this, we want to get uh, the first uh, uh, goal is to get the estimate of the wall of the section because this estimate uh, highlights features such as eccentricity or asymmetry or reversion of fluxes that are of interest when studying this pathology. Now, we have physiological boundary condition. The velocity of the blood flow at the arterial wall must be zero because of the friction between the blood particle and uh, the uh, wall of the artery. So we need to use a technique that can uh, uh, comply with this uh, boundary condition. And for this reason, the first uh, thing we tried is a special spinal regression that uh, penalizing the uh, functional uh, I was showing you before. Because this can include various type of uh, boundary condition, uh, and in particular, we can force uh, our estimate to be zero at the boundaries of the domain, which are here the uh, wall of the artery. This is the estimate we obtained, uh, and we were not happy because this, as you can see, as an, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but it's strongly rhomboidal. It has this uh, square diesel line, and these are certainly not physiological. They are simply due to the fact that uh, our observation come in a cross-shaped uh, pattern, and we can do nothing about it. Um, so the problem is that, of course, once, when you penalize the Laplacian, since this is a measure of curvature, the estimate move uh, is smoothed towards a plane where you do not have observation. But in this applied problem, we have uh, a very detailed uh, prior information on how uh, the phenomenon behavior is like. Uh, there is a vast literature about the modeling of blood flow. And for what service our purpose is, it suffices to know that the uh, theoretical solution of this velocity field into a perfectly straight pipe with circular, um, circular uh, shape and without turbulence would be a parabolic profile. So we would expect, in fact, to have uh, isolines uh, which are almost circular. Now, uh, to induce this uh, prior inf information into the model, we will include uh, a more complex partial differential equation describing, in fact, uh, these uh, uh, features. And uh, well, I, we need also to, in fact, uh, generalize the model to include for aerial observation, because here we have observation over beams, not pontual observation. Uh, now, the uh, PD that we include is a general second order elliptic uh, operator with space varying uh, parameters. And in, for this particular observation, our a priori information can be translated in terms of uh, a diffusion tensor field that uh, 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 induces an anisotropic non stationary diffusion that smooths the observation along concentric circle and a transport vector field that smoothing said the observation from the center of the artery to the wall of the artery. And we do not need, in this case, a neither a shrink effect nor a forcing term. Uh, now, uh, the estimator, F, that minimizes the um, sum, uh, the penalized sum of square error, uh, exists unique and uh, is uh, obtained solving this coupled system of differential problem. Uh, this problem is well set in some uh, appropriate uh, space of function. These are sub spaces. Now, this uh, problem cannot be solved analytically. These are infinite dimensional problems, and the way we deal with it is uh, the, the classical. We reduce it to a finite dimensional problem by introducing a suitable basis expansion. And since these are uh, 
differential problem, what we use as a business function is the one provided by finite element. Uh, well, this is the case of pointwise uh, data, uh, very little changes, and in this following now we'll uh, follow this formulation because it's simple, the expression are simple. Now, finite element, the strategy is exactly the same as uh, smoothing spline. So you partition the domain of interest into subdomains, and over each of the subdomains, you consider a polynomial function uh, so that the union of the polynomial thesis gives us a continuous piecewise polynomial function that closely approximates the solution to the estimation problem. This is, for instance, the uh, basis for uh, linear um, finite, triangular finite element. Now we need some notation. Z will be the vector of observed data values, and then C1, CK will denote the node of the mesh, the partitioning of the domain. C1, CK will be the corresponding basis function, and the matrix C will collect the evaluation of this basis at the energy allocation. Then we need a couple of matrices that uh, um, involve this finite element function. And in particular, if you look at this A, you can notice that it, this A discretizes the penalty. Uh, a piece, in fact, of our uh, roughness penalty. And once we have introduced this basis as function, in fact, uh, the estimation problem reduces to solving a linear uh, system. And in fact, the estimator has the classical penalized uh, regression form. This is the classical form of penalized regression, with this P being the matrix that penalizes the roughness term. And um, um, because of this, we can readily derive the classical inferential tools because we can compute the mean invariances of the estimator and thus compute confidence, pointwise confidence bounds for F, prediction intervals for new observation, estimate the error variance. If you want, you can select the smoothing parameter lambda via generalized cross validation. Now we, studied the, we are studying the um, asymptotic properties. We were able to prove that they are asymptotically unbiased. We are in the process, but it is analytically extremely tricky to prove consistency. And hopefully, with some help, uh, we might want to prove also asymptotic uh, Gaussianity. I'm, I'm confident that they are asymptotically Gaussian, but proving, of course, is a different matter. Now, this is the estimate obtained by uh, considering uh, this prior information about the phenomenon, and now we are certainly very happy. These are uh, almost circular isolines. It nicely uh, highlights uh, the asymmetry of the blood flow, which in this case is due to the curvature of the carotid. And in general, this estimate uh, highlights features that are of interest to the medical doctor. Moreover, of course, they will allow now we are in the process of uh, reconstructing all of the data and estimating all this data. Uh, they will allow uh, a population study with the um, difficulty that uh, this uh, uh, section, of course, they have a shape which is patient specific, so we need to develop a suitable registration method to deal with it. These are also used for inflow condition, patient specific inflow condition for computational fluid dynamics. These uh, uh, simulations uh, uh, are becoming extremely important because they allow to synthetically verify beforehand uh, what will be the impact of different uh, surgical intervention. So it is hoped that in the future this instrument will be used uh, before deciding what uh, intervention to do for each patient uh, looking at its morphology and the features of its uh, fluid dynamic. Now, our data are, in fact, uh, uh, space-time data. And so now, currently, but this is just ongoing work, so I'm just showing some picture. Uh, currently, we are trying to extend this model to involve also time. Uh, and we do it by including PDE models that uh, involve also time, parabolic uh, partial differential equation. Now, this is uh, a very first uh, result. This is the... Uh, data over the time uh, lapse of a few heartbeats. So this is, the, this is a 3D image of the blood flow. This is the diastolic phase. We are moving towards the systolic phase. So I don't know how clearly you can see, but uh, uh, if you look at the data, there will be a phase where the bottom beams uh, 
go higher first, and this is it, and then they move, the higher values move to the uh, upper part of the artery. So the estimate is really capturing very well these uh, um, uh, moving asymmetries of the data. Again, here we have the further um, difficulty uh, that uh, the domain uh, of the problem, that is the arterial wall, also deform over time due to the pressure of the blood flow on the wall. And uh, again, we are trying to include this by a suitable conformal mapping all of these different time instants to uh, one uh, time instant where we can use a circular geometry. Now, um, so far we are at the state, I would say, of approval concept. We can include uh, advanced uh, um, differential model into the statistical models and use them to model the space variation. But if we want to offer this as an alternative, a concrete alternative to what is classically done in statistics, we need to make a, a strong effort now. First of all, we need to be able to um, estimate the hyperparameters in these uh, um, in these uh, PDE models. So these, uh, I as I was describing before, these uh, uh, diffusion transport and reaction terms, uh, they depend on space, of course, because this is the way we translate our prior information about the uh, non-stationarity of the field, but they could depend on some hyperparameters. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, we will be able to study these, uh, to estimate these upper parameters from data. That will be the analogous of estimating the parameters in the usual Gaussian materna or uh, spherical covariances. And a possible road, uh, um, a possible road in this direction will be to extend in the um, cascading, parameter cascading technique that uh, Rams introduced for estimating parameters in ordinal differential equation. Now, uh, estimating parameters of ordinal dif differential equation is becoming a very hot topic, but of course here we face the much more complex problem of estimating parameters in partial differential equation. Moreover, um, we need, of course, to estimate what are the regularity conditions that the PDE has to satisfy in order to induce a valid covariance structure uh, and uh, try to rigorously uh, derive uh, the form of the covariance structure that is induced by the differential model. So uh, last but not least, uh, this is all coded in R and MATLAB. Uh, this is just one of the various uh, direction of research in which we um, developed this model. Um, another one that I meant to talk about today is of, uh, the fact that we can handle data distributed not on planar domain, but on curved domain, on manifold domain. And these are a few uh, references about it. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. So, um, again, we have time for a couple of questions. Oh. Uh, so, you, you just mentioned that there's a space-time uh, model. So, have, have you considered that uh, covariance structure in the space and also along time. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I, I don't think I have slides here, uh, but we can include the space varying covariance. This is no uh, problem uh, at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the paper, those, uh, the formulation is already included, uh, I believe. Um, I also didn't mention that uh, I probably had some slides, but we, of course, uh, um, compare this to um, other techniques uh, just to see how the uh, inclusion of a priori knowledge improves the results. Uh, and in particular, we um, compare to the case where we simply penalize the Laplacian and we compare to Sophie Smutin, which is another technique that uh, penalizes uh, um, penalize some square error similar to um, spacious prime regression and uh, allows for the inclusion of boundary condition. So, Questions? I, I have a quick one. You mentioned that you've uh, done most of the calculations in MATLAB. I mean, how long are we talking about for some of these simulations in terms of the, the blood flow for the 
you know, you showed the example where uh, you were linking it into a computational fluid dynamics model, which you um, suggested that the, uh, the medics might use to then think yeah. about different uh, strategies for um, dealing with the, the situation. The uh, computation fluid dynamics is not work of mine, of course, this is work of uh, a numerical analysts working within the project. Mm -hmm. uh, those models are uh, models that exploit Navier-Stokes equation. They are uh, coded not in MATLAB, but in, uh, no, uh, so for instance, in Polytechnico, we are developing an advanced library, is a C++ library, which is called Life Fiverr. Uh, that uh, is uh, used to model these uh, fluid dynamics within the arteries, within the uh, heart, uh, and other uh, cardiovascular problems. So that is uh, the, the, my research, the um, department where I'm working with, uh, um, and the research group in which I work uh, has a very strong uh, group in uh, um, numerical analysis and specifically for application uh, in the medical field. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, then I think we should thank our three speakers very much for a very interesting session. Thank you.